Um, this um, Jeremy Allen, so I, he was a um, guy born about 1736, died 1810 in Durham Jail. He was a piper, boarder, and, uh, gypsy family in Northumberland, and Northumberland Scottish borders. Incredible musician. Uh, it's got him out of a lot of trouble, but also a brilliant horse thief, which got him into a lot of trouble. And uh, he was the official fighter of the Jubilee of Thumbland for, um, for a while until he got sacked, a couple of years. And, um, and his wayward behaviour kind of matched that of his aristocratic patrons. And um, he was a fascinating guy. So he, there's, uh, there's a tune called um, Jamie Allen, I think fiddlers learn first learn to play tunes, you know, which is named like him. And all the Northumberland pipers sort of um, look up to him. Anyway, there's a lot of um, <coughs> a lot of stories about him. There's some biographies, quite thick, 600 page things published in a couple few years after his death. Um, he was sentenced to jail at the age of 70 for stealing a horse and riding it in Gator and riding it to Scotland to sell. So, um, might have some other, I suppose. Anyway, I sort of wanted to find out how much of these kind of picaresque stories are true. And so I went to the National Archives and found his criminal record, records and depositions and so on. Those of them, um, and, and also his army records, because one of his tricks was to join the army for recruiting money and then uh, get the recruiting sergeant pissed and then escape. And he did it to two different recruiting parties in one day once. And I thought, well, oh, that was a legend too, until I looked into the army records and they got these big fat volumes called Book of Deserters. And he features frequently. <coughs> and, um, as does his brother and his associates. So I'll read you some of the stuff from, um, oops, um, from, from this book, which started out as a libretto for the opera. Um, or folk opera. Uh, but I, I do a lot more research in the middle of this book. And it, be it begins with this poem called The Charm. You who make music and music makes, whose fingers fly, make of air a song, your breath be steady and the tune be long. I wrote a fact for Catherine Cotel, uh, take out and told you would start to freeze up when she gave solo performances, get stage from it. Um, so the book basically is, um, is, a, is, a, is a mixture of information from um, depositions and from the 18th century uh, and poems and songs that I wrote to accompany it, but pretty much documents it. Right? So, and, and I used the, and the po poems um, which are clearly mine, and they're not songs. Um, in a sense, I used as his uh, inner voice reading as an additional narrative voice. So, and, and also thinking of ways to use the um, material that I found in the depositions. I, I found resident golf in Testament, you know, as a great model. So, if that sounds familiar, a couple of these documentary poems. That's, why? March horses, wind tunnels, a hill's furrow, where crows hang and skate, two black blades slicing air and less than a feather between them. John Bell, his information, 7th of March, 1776. On Monday night, John Bell's stables were screwed and his black mare went missing. On Tuesday morning early, Richard Thompson found a chestnut Galloway. Galloway gelding the black mare, the saddle and bridle missing from his stables. Thomas Trumbull looking for his Shetland ponies in Galloway's met John Bell, who said it's market day at Edinburgh, but we sell there and rode north together. They gave out exact descriptions of their animals and by eight o'clock that night heard of a sighting on the Glasgow Road at sunrise. But they lost track, gave up the chase and turned south, where they met the black mare with Jamie Allen on its back and his brother Robert riding the other. Below the ridge, above wind and scribed stone, 
drop shadowed in moss. A buzzard splays still of wind and lifts in the cold updraft of the valley's steep incline, a hum of moment. Dark clouds contour pale, a glow of veiled sun inhaled in hill fog, thickens mist with light. Like my heart, a lock starts up, its striding song, long and pauses, flaps, a fast wind forward. Sheep trails entwine the west face, a hair breaks, as though I thought. She sat astride me in the dark, and we were drunk. Rain on the attic roof, a random patterning of impact. Or was it static from her stockings, lit the room, an <coughs> instrument? I wasn't silent. So I also researched a lot of his, um, like, police, if you want to find out about somebody, find out about their known associates. So, so I did that and found criminal records of some people he met <coughs> and spent time with, um, who he grew up with, really. Um, John Clark's information. Do you want to make enough to buy yourself some shoes? John Winter asked John Clark. And with his son Robert and a Scott called Drummond, went to the house of William and Hannah Hogg, both 86 years old and in bed with the door bolted. At about 8 o'clock, while Clark kept watch, the others used a three-pronged iron grave to force the door. When it burst open, Hannah recognised the men, having bought horn spoons the week before from Peg Winter. Robert held Hogg by the throat, while John beat his head with a grape, leaving severe cuts over his right eye and the left arm. Hannah was dragged to her knees and slapped. Damn thee, that was money in the hoose for the coup. But they never had a kill. And John said, turn out the money or I'll kill thee. When Clark heard the scream, he came in and pulled John away by the coat to snow. Don't get the same for that. There's money in the hoose, man. They shook 14 linen shirts. They took 14 linen shirts, 18 linen caps, three white linen handkerchiefs, one black silk hood, three linen sheets, one bedgown, a woolen coat, a waistcoat and breeches, three cakes of bread and some butter. Before leaving, they broke the bedstead and everything they possibly could. A low sky hung over the hills, hunched and harried like their shoulders, and the ragged gallery. The heather was like the border, ill-definable and sometimes impenetrable. They found a clough deep in rock, below a wind that screamed a sack of cats. They'd been there before, and they'd be there again. If the storm hadn't ripped, they'd, they'd have made counsel by dusk. But anywhere is where they were going, and there was as good as it got. Annie found a windbreak and gathered kindling quickly without talking. They ate in silence, and when they finished, lay close, listening to the wind and the fire's crack. Tell them lock up. So go and play your pipes and wing your violin. The wind is howling through the dike, but you will not let me in. The reeds that grow through dunes of snow play an icy pitch, but while our breath are warm the mess, death turns out the broom. When death turns out the broom, we'll all be swept with nothing but blossom on the broom. Then who will play my pipe so you, your violin, when the wind is howling through the dike and the dancers within? Clouds drag, shadows across contours, storm hail between hassock, while west winds chase light, chasing vapour from the coast. A raven blows in with a croak and settles on a cairn. He has grass respond to gusts. Pale golden beads are black, reflected in a pool whose surface stippled wind as her dress fell, light as a shadow on her body. And if she were next to me now, all night under the low beams and shifting tiles, beneath the wind, held for a moment as it passes and is forgotten, like a dream on waking or a blown note home to silence.